so my prop topic is going to be changed because of Dr. Rax. He wants to know if I can train pain doctors to learn minimally invasive spine surgery. So how many think of, of you think you can do surgery? About a third, yeah. Okay, I think that's good. The answer is yes. 10 years ago, I would say no, because you don't think like surgeons, and I think like a surgeon, and I go after the pathoanatomy and pathophysiology of pain. And as I learned about Dr. Rack's technique from his students, and this person here is Andrew Roberts, who trained with Dr. Rax, has tremendous experience and admiration for him. However, after watching me do surgery, he says, no, pain doctors are not trained well enough to do surgery. You have to train them to think like a surgeon. That's pretty difficult. So I have continued to publish on this, uh, not always in peer-reviewed journals, because I found that it was a, a lot of problems working with people who are prejudiced and probably if they see laser or they see something they don't recognize, they reject your paper. So I got tired of submitting to these prestigious pain journals. So I did open access and now the last five years I've published over 15 uh, in open access journals. So one of them was in Continuous Research Online Library, The Role and Future of Endoscopic Spine Surgery, which I was going to talk about. But you have to know I'm very conflicted. I have 20 years experience as a general orthopedist with a focus on spine. And then the last 27 years, I've treated the cause of pain in the spine. So I'm very conflicted because of my 27 years of experience in greater than 10,000 procedures that I've done with less than 1% complication and about 87 to 90% success. So I developed what I call the YES endoscopic spine system in 1997 for Richard Wolf. I have published over 135 level three, four, and five evidence-based medicine publications, but most of them were published as a level five expert opinion. There's a role for that. I'm very conflicted. I own companies and I do things that, uh, just like Chairman Mao says, it's glorious to make money, so I try to make money with my ideas and form companies in the US. I have also published about endoscopic spine surgery because I think it should be a multidisciplinary specialty appropriately trained and for appropriately experienced providers. You have to be trained to do it well, otherwise you're going to discredit the procedure. So I've published about moving away from fusion even though I was initially a fusion doctor. I had my last year of residency in scoliosis and I was doing fusions and I found this is not the way to go. So I think there's going to be a change in the landscape of fusion because reimbursement is decreasing. However, all the stakeholders continue to fuse because they can still make a lot more money fusing. But studies that have promoted fusion uh, as the best and most effective procedure for better outcomes is being challenged because you don't have to fuse. It doesn't make sense for you to fuse because your body will fuse itself if it needs to if you take care of the pain long enough. So the last few years there has been literature that says do more decompression without destabilizing and do less fusion. This is very disruptive to spine surgeons. And I don't know if it's disruptive to pain management, but it's really takes the attention of pain management. But pain management doctors don't think like surgeons. So 10 years ago, I said, no way can you learn unless you learn to think like a surgeon. But now I kind of changed my mind because at 77 years old, I realized that there are going to be turf battles. And more and more, the battles I was fighting against non-allopathic uh, uh, people, uh, they end up getting sometimes even better than the surgeons because we're not expanding our views. So surgical pain care is what I call that incorporates the concepts and technology 
that I think escapes both surgeons and non-surgeons because we are now able to operate on the pathoanatomy and the pathophysiology of pain. So it's essentially a new subspecialty that disruptive to surgical and non-surgical specialists alike. The lack of appropriate training will cause some practitioners, whether surgeons or in pain management doctors, to oppose the foraminal approach to being, by being uninformed or poorly trained and not technically competent. All those reasons are going to be causing people who are on the podium to speak against it. And when they do, I say either you're uninformed or you're a lousy surgeon. So there are anatomic risk and pitfalls that have to be known because it's all about anatomy. And you have to be, have proper training to overcome the anomalous anatomy and differences in anatomy that you have to deal with when you're transgressing the foramen, which is where most of the pain generators are. So the future is going to be utilized by you, non-surgeons, and also as surgeons, but only those who are adequately trained. And acceptance is going to depend on the politics and the business of spine in very parts, various parts of the world. When I'm in Asia, I'm accepted a lot more than when I'm in Europe or in the United States. Because in Asia, I think they have less economic incentive to promote their area uh, as a turf, uh, area of turf battle. Now, I just decided to publish my research that I did in 2002, where I was able to measure SEP as a sensory pathway to patients that I operate on, and you're able to average out the SEPs to show that there is indeed a change in the sensory pathway. Now, when I submitted this, I got very high grades uh, for abstract, but I never thought about publishing it because I didn't want to go through peer review of people who didn't understand what I was doing. So, I focused on failed back surgery syndrome. Now, failed back surgery is probably a boon for all you pain management doctors because as we do surgery and do fusions, 30% have problems, even if they do a good job because our spine is not used to being fused. We still are mobile and you have problems even do you do a perfect fusion that the adjacent level starts to deteriorate like welding the front end of your car and thinking you don't ever have to line your tires, but the engine mounts shake the engine loose. So there's a consequence. So I have published on that, and in researching all the different types of pain generators from the foramen, I have indicated 17 endoscopically documented painful conditions that some of you don't even know exist, but I was surprised that God, Dr. Rax knew some of it. He was showing me a, a, a um, synovial cyst, and he's showing me how he did it, and I was showing him how I did it. So I don't think I convinced him, and he didn't convince me either. So, but I'm going to hopefully show you. I've talked about this and had posters about failed back surgery and all the different causes. None of this is all in the literature. So. Endoscopic spine surgery will provide the least minimally invasive pr a procedure for solving our patient's spinal pain. How? You have to target the pain source and the generator surgically, first focusing on the disc, because that's where it all begins, like chicken and the egg. And then the facet innervation, and then decompress the foramen in the hidden zone of McNabb, which is the axilla between the traversing and the exiting nerve. So how do you do that? I do it with an endoscope. I use this scope that I developed in 1997 for a German company for the diagnosis and treatment to identify painful pathoanatomy. I use it as a surgical tool. I use it to do discectomy and nucleectomy. I do it for decompression, intradiscal therapy that also decompresses thermal annuloplasty, which we hit upon with radio frequency ablation, and I use bipolar. It doesn't have to be pulsed, it doesn't have to be con uh, continuous, but it has to be able to ablate the innervation of the disc annulus and the facet joint. 
So, and then disc irrigation. Why does it work? Because that's what Dr. Rax does. He does the irrigation transsacrally, and I do it transferamily. And it gets rid of cytokines and then the irritation of the annulus and the DRG that causes severe pain out of proportion to what the, the imaging shows. So the nerve ablation can be done with radio frequency. I use bipolar under direct vision. And I call it intradiscal annuloplasty, which means I denervate the nerves that innervate the annulus, which are the sinovertebral nerves coming from the dorsal ramus. Then I do rhizolysis by direct visualization of the nerves itself that is innervating the facet as well as the annulus. So this all is responsible for disc and axial back pain. And we are able to facilitate and augment the surgical approaches that surgeons use, which culminates in a fusion. We don't need a fusion unless you have deformity, trauma, or instability, because our bodies will fuse itself if you control the pain, and then you'll be better uh, without fusion. Your body does it yourself. The endoscope is designed to identify painful pathoanatomy intradiscally and transferamily, in vivo, meaning with patient awake, for the endoscopic treatment of the lumbar spine. I have multiple uh, peer-reviewed journals that appeared articles on this along with some of my fellows, Dr. Gore, which one of my first Indian fellows back in 2000. I've also trained a lot of Koreans and Chinese uh, and a few Caucasians and a few Europeans. But after having said that, although I think we need to handle the pathoanatomy and pathophysiology surgically, pain management is guided and promoted by Gabor Rax. I have tremendous respect for him. He's a legend in transcaudal and translaminar neurolysis and procedures that he has developed is aptly named the Rax procedure. I have had pain management doctors join my practice. It didn't work out because they just still don't think the way I do and they don't have the skills to do the surgery. So I had hired a pain management doctor who thought it was really good, but it didn't work out. But now I think that I need to be able to train those of you who are managing pain to how to use the surgical technique to go after the source of the pain. So again, I'm conflicted. I'm conflicted because of my greater than 10,000 procedures which I've documented over the years. These are with level five personal observations like that cartoon that says we should write that spot down where these Neanderthals killed an elephant with one single arrow. So the evidence base that I talk about, it's not going to be like doing randomized double blind studies. That's averaging average surgeons. I'm like a combination of Stephen Curry, LeBron James, and Michael Jordan put together. And those of you can strive to be very good at what you do so that you can have evidence based endoscopically endoscopically, visually based, expedient and efficiently based, economically based and expertise based, the E in evidence-based medicine. Now, let me do a little philosophy because I'm Asian and we have certain biases in our own philosophy. The practice of evidence-based medicine really is the integration of clinical expertise, your patient's personal needs and values, and the best research evidence that you can provide. Almost all physicians, including all of you, feel that you're already practicing evidence-based medicine, as I see from all the talks that I hear. Medical schools teach and use the scientific method. Many of you read medical journals appropriate to your practice. But this I stole from NAS President Waters. What you think you may know may no longer be valid or become disproven over time with future research. What you want to know is impossible to completely assimilate at one time. And what you need to know may be very hard to find, and that's still appropriate. Patient values are also important. If you go to Asia, most people don't want to have 
surgery because they believe in acupuncture and thousands of years of history in natural medicine. So you have to rely on your patients' opinions heavily who depend on you as their physician for personal choices. Different cultures have different beliefs based on cultural biases that affect their acceptance of treatment. Most people would accept non-surgery as the treatment, which makes, puts you in the driver's seat. If you learn how to do the treatment with pain management, or I don't call it management, I say pain care, pain care. And you as a physician will offer guidance to your patient for a joint decision of your choice as long as you get them better and don't make them worse. So the best research evidence is to reduce bias. But it's almost impossible because we are all biased, okay? I'm biased because of what I know, and anybody disagree with me, I'm worse than Trump. I'll just go and debate them. But I've met my match when I debate Gabor Rax, because he, he won't bend, and not, neither will I. So I don't know if he's Republican and I'm Democrat, or I'm Democrat and he's Republican. But you know what I mean, political, medical politics. But we all promote ethical decision-making that minimizes outside influence. Here's my take-home message. There is a very big gap between pain management and traditional surgical techniques. We have to learn to close the gap by learning what each of us do best. Formal training is very rare for surgeons and non-surgeons and it's not universally taught in spine or pain programs. For what I do, it's private practice. So the premise is that pain begins with physiology of inflammation and this degeneration, even in asymptomatic patients, has a high risk of eventually developing low back pain. I, Ricardo said he's gonna give me some extra time, but Dr. Rack says no way. So I'm going to leave it up to you if you want to continue to listen because I have a lot to say. There are different technologies and to prove my point, here is, can you uh, hit that? This is the annular tear. And when I look at with the endoscope, you can see that there's some inflammation in the tear itself. If it's leaking to the dorsal ganglion, the tear is out of proportion to what you see on the MRI. And endoscopic toxic annular tears, this is going to take one and a half minutes. I'm going to just skip that because I don't have enough time. But what I can tell you is I, I document everything with imaging. I have a TriCaster recorder with internet capability where I can show everything that I'm seeing with external and internal cameras and endoscopic cameras where I take pictures of everything I operate on with my patient awake and I'm talking to them. I don't use any general anesthetic. I only use local. And from what I hear from some of the talks, just local lidocaine is going to decrease the, the cell membrane and it's going to give you relief. And so I personally had surgery myself. Can we click those two uh, slides? I'll show you what sinodiffusion nerves look like. Uh, so can you do that? You see how the nerves are in the inflammatory membrane? You can actually see it and you can actually ablate that with radio frequency and after taking that out, the pain goes away. But those are little nerves that I can see. And so I correlate with what I see by what I do. So uh, the learning curve is long and shallow, not steep. Direct decompression through the foramen is going to allow you to do decompression, ablation and irrigation without destabilizing the spinal segment. And treating degenerative conditions of the lumbar spine, it starts with chymopapain, but it also starts with selective endoscopic discectomy. There are other options, ozone, disjunct, biologics, the Rax procedure. There, I get, I get a free dinner for that, right, Gabor? So anyway, the lessons to learn is you have to identify the pain generators in lumbar spine and how to select your patients. I'm going to go over this because all, very quickly, all of you know how to do that. But back pain in sciatica is very complex. You always have to do discography. So I'm against anybody who says discography is controversial. 
It's because those against it don't know how to use it or do it. And, and HIZ is not always present. Here is concordant pain at a level that looks normal compared to the abnormal level at 5.1. And this is what you see with granulation tissue. You can see that with an endoscope. You can also do transferal epidural blocks to look at the uh, pathoanatomy of stenosis. And you use diagnostic and therapeutic injections. I do it different than you. You do Scotty Dog down the tunnel. I use it from a surgical technique. I don't need to use dull needles. I don't use the bend needles. Everything has to be straight. And if bone is in the way, I simply remove the bone so I can get to it. So I think you have to learn surgical trajectory to get the cannula instrument in the right place. You have to look for the annular tears. You have to go after the pathoanatomy. And you have to uh, see the pathoanatomy by Rauschning, who does who has shown us how the DRG is affected by the disc, by the facet, and by stenosis. So uh, I'm trying to go over this fast. That's what the DRG looks like. See that? It's a little swelling in the nerve itself. So anyway, I don't know why I'm, getting, I'm trying to get this done. Epiduroscopy. I was against epiduroscopy. I thought it was a sham procedure. I looked at the first epidural scope in 1991. I was not impressed. It's getting a lot better. And some Korean doctors really believe in it. And I think Dr. Hevener and Dr. Rax believes in it. But they're, you're limited what you can do through the tailpipe. Okay? If I can repair your car, if I don't have to go through a tailpipe, it's easier. But if you do it through tailpipe, it might be harder. But what I do is I say, at first, I'm against it. Now I'm agnostic about epiduroscopy. Sorry. But then here's some other things. I can augment the disc by putting in uh, hydrogel that's going to support the disc and keep it from collapsing. But the problem is you may have extrusion. So you have to know how to take that out. So as the population ages with repetitive disc injury, disc degeneration, uh, you're going to be able to only slow disc degeneration. You're never going to cure it because we're all going to die one of these days. And so we're using Cambin's Triangle. You can look on my website to look at YouTube video examples, top 10 playlist images. Uh, so to all of you non-surgeons, work in cooperation with a surgeon. And the two of you will do much better for your patient. Work within the scope of your practice to avoid turf battles. Spine surgeons are concerned that non-surgeons are not quali to, qualified to perform spine surgery. But I can tell you, I have some pain management doctors that I've trained that I really respect, and they probably know more than my surgeon colleagues, but they have to understand what I'm doing. Thank you very much.